Finally, the last component is detection disk. So detection disk is the likelihood that the auditor will not detect a misstatement that exists in the financial statements that could be material either individually or in aggregate with other misstatements. Now, detection risk is a function of the effectiveness of the audit procedure and of its application by the auditor. So, meaning to say, while inherent and control risk are function of the client's accounting records and system, detection risk is a function of the auditor's procedure. So, meaning, detection risk will fully depend no, on the auditor, on the effectiveness of the auditor's audit procedures and application of those procedures by the auditor. Take note also that detection risk cannot be reduced to zero because the auditor does not examine all documents or evidence of our client and because also of other factors such as the possibility of the auditor uh, selecting inappropriate procedure or misapplying audit procedure or even misinterpreting the results. So that is why this Factors that we have to consider in assessing the acceptable detection risk. Okay, so although the last or the last part that we mentioned earlier that would cost or contribute to detection risk may be addressed through adequate planning and proper assignment of duties to audit team or personnel, and even the application of professional skepticism or supervision and review of the audit perform audit work perform can also reduce those reasons that would contribute to detection risk. Now, another important uh, concept about detection risk is that among the different components of audit risk, it is the only risk that the auditor can control. So, we cannot control inherent risk. We cannot control control risk. We can only control detection risk because this is the component that depends on the performance of our audit procedures. So, thus, as auditors, we plan the nature, time, and extent of our audit procedures to reduce the audit risk to an acceptably low level. So because we mentioned earlier that the overall audit risk is equal to inherent risk, control risk, times detection risk. So all this is also known as uh, what we call the audit risk model. So this audit risk model is a tool used by us auditors to understand the relationship among the various components of risk arising from audit engagement. So, for us to manage the overall audit risk. So, because remember earlier, we cannot control inherent, we cannot control control risk. So, therefore, to reduce the audit risk, so we have to, uh, we have to adjust no, the acceptable detection risk in our engagement. So, express in equation form, our formula is audit risk is equal to inherent risk times control risk times detection risk. So, our goal is to reduce the overall audit risk to an acceptable level. So, this is also referred to as the desired level of audit risk. In order to achieve the desired level, we have to first assess the levels of each component of the uh, component of the audit risk model. Now, these risk values are not readily quantifiable. That is why as auditors, we have to use professional judgment to assess this risk. So this means that this equation is not typically used to calculate risk just like other mathematical equation. So what we do is that this tool guide us to assess the risk values in some form even by descriptive means. So that's why I mentioned earlier that the audit risk may be assessed either in quantitative or on qualitative basis. Then we use this model to establish the relationship between or among the risk and take action to reduce the overall risk to an acceptable level. Finally, as mentioned earlier, the first two components of the audit risk, inherent in control risk, make up the risk of material misstatement or possibility that the financial statements are materially misstated. So that is why this risk of material misstatement is a function of the management's action and controls and therefore as auditors, we cannot manipulate nor influence it. The only thing that we can do on the first two uh, risk component is to assess them. Okay, so we assess inherent risk and control risk in every audit. 
we can make separate or combined assessment of inherent risk and control risk. So in audit, when we assess them on a combined level, so we call it combined risk assessment or CRA. Finally, the last component, which is the audit risk, ah, sorry, which is the detection risk, is a function of the auditor's evidence gathering procedures. As mentioned earlier, it depends on our audit procedures. And this is the only component that the auditor can control. So detection risk can be manipulated by various means. For example, if we want to, uh, for example, increase or, de or decrease the detection risk, so we can uh, change the component of the audit team, so we can change the duration of our work, or even the amount of the evidence that we plan to obtain. So for example, detection risk and thus audit risk is normally reduced when we put more skilled personnel. Or, for example, we increase our audit procedures. Or we perform more reliable uh, audit tests so compared to less reliable ones like analytical procedures. So if we want, for example, to decrease the overall audit risk, so we need also de to decrease the acceptable detection risk. Or if we allow audit risk to be increased, then we can also increase the acceptable detection risk. To illustrate that uh, point further, so let's have the following uh, analysis. So for a given level of desired or acceptable audit risk, the acceptable level of detection risk will have an inverse or opposite relationship to the assessment of the risk of material misstatement at the assertion level. So meaning to the assessed inherent and controlled risk. The greater the risk of material misstatement that the auditor believes, then the less detection risk can be accepted. Okay, so because we want to drive this acceptable audit risk at a low level. Okay, now conversely, if the level of uh, risk of material misstatement is lower, so we can also increase our acceptable level of detection risk. So because in this case, we can still maintain an appropriate level of audit risk. So because in the first place, the risk of material misstatement is lower. So usually this is applicable to maintain uh, the audit economical. So because if we always wanted to uh, decrease the detection risk by performing more audit procedure, then the audit would be too costly at some point. Okay, so at some times, we can increase detection risk, especially if the risk of material statement is lower and still achieve a low level of audit risk. So because take note of the effect, if we decrease our detection risk, that means we have to perform more audit procedures. So if we increase the level of detection risk, so that means we can accept less audit procedures or we can perform less audit procedures. So we can use our assessment of the risk of material misstatements to manage a certain level of acceptable audit risk. So we'll uh, elaborate no, this audit risk model So when we discuss the performance of the audit procedures, now when we go to the discussion of audit process itself. So we will go back to this audit risk model. So finally, let's go to the limitations of audit process. So similar to what we have discussed uh, in the first two video lectures before this, Introduction to Assurance Services and Introduction to Audit, so we cannot reduce audit risk to zero So because of certain limitations of the audit or even a detection risk. Now we cannot reduce detection risk to zero So because of the limitations of the audit. So like the nature of financial reporting as we have already discussed in Topic 2 of this video lecture, so nature of audit procedures and the need for the audit to be conducted within a reasonable time and at a reasonable cost. So also in expressing our opinion, so we do not express mat, uh, opinion on certain matters such as the future viability of the entity or effectiveness or efficiency of management or compliance with all laws and regulation. So we have also this uh, discussion no, in uh, ASR02, Introduction to Auditing. 
So finally, the last part of uh, this discussion is the overview of the risk-based audit process. So the risk-based audit process, as uh, so we will discuss or tackle in the succeeding video lectures, is divided into three major parts. No? The risk assessment phase, the risk response phase, and the conclusion and reporting phase. So this logical flow of our procedures is uh, what would be the foundation of what we call the risk-based audit process that we introduced earlier. So we said that we, when we say risk-based audit process, it means that we focus on areas wherein there's a like high, higher likelihood that material misstatements could occur compared to other areas. Because the premise, again, is that uh, most businesses today, we cannot already, uh, we cannot anymore test on a 100% basis all the items in their financial statements. It would not be feasible anymore. So because of the advances in uh, businesses, in the way that they do their transaction, so it's just not possible to audit everything. So we have to prioritize certain areas. And how do we do that? So by following these three steps or three phases of the risk-based audit process. So under risk assessment, we perform such procedures such as client acceptance and continuance as part of our preliminary engagement activities, planning the audit, so which include the consideration of materiality and audit risk, so understanding the entity including its internal control, and identifying and assessing risk of material misstatements. So after assessing, risk uh, assessing the risk of material misstatement, we develop our response. So that response would be used to address the assess risk on the financial statements level and on the assertion level. So we also determine the extent of our testing, whether we will test everything or we will use sampling as appropriate and then perform our further audit procedures, which consist of the test of control and substantive test. We also consider risk of material misstatement arising from fraud, errors, and non-compliance with laws and regulation, and we also consider the work of others, such as experts, internal auditors, so those uh, uh, auditors of other components of the entity, so we also consider that in developing our risk response. And then finally, we conclude our audit by forming an opinion on the financial statement and issuing the auditor's report. So we also perform some post-audit responsibilities, including uh, assembly of our audit files as part of our audit documentation. And in all of this, so we always maintain our attitude of professional skepticism. So we obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence and document them, apply our professional judgment, and maintain audit quality. So we'll discuss in detail the service-based audit process in our future video lectures. So that's it. So that's our discussion, the end of our discussion for this topic.